All right, so we're going to talk about succession planning today. So I want to tell you a little bit more about myself. I, I do have two companies, um, but prior to starting all of all of this, this part of my career, I was in HR consulting, and I did that for 16 years. I worked for CUNA a little bit doing their HR consulting, but I mainly had my own companies doing HR consulting. And it was for credit unions and small community-based hospitals and other nonprofits primarily. Um, I did that, you know, like I said before, about 16 years, and I decided I really wanted to focus on the boards and um, executive level. And so I got into executive coaching. So I am an executive coach. Um, about probably 80% of my clients are CEOs in the credit union industry. Um, and a lot of that comes from my work with succession planning. So, um, But I do executive coaching. I do a little bit of strategic planning. do a lot of board coaching as well. Um, what I've been seeing lately is when a new CEO is starting, uh, they have some questions about their relationship with their board, and just to, to kind of get them both on the same page. Uh, sometimes I'll come in. Um, so I've been doing quite a bit of that, getting quite a few requests on that recently. Um, but I was also on the board of the University of Wisconsin Credit Union. So I'm from Wisconsin, from Madison. I was on the board for 20 years. I stopped because I started getting these presentations on board succession planning, and they'll say, well, why are you on the board so long? No, I, that's not the reason I really stopped. Um, but 20 years was a long time, and um, it was just time for me to, to step away uh, from it. I was chair for four years. I was on the executive committee for 12 years, did a lot. I negotiated, helped negotiate the contracts for the CEO um, for every contract that we've had with him. He's been with us for six so, um, but it's been good. So, I have a lot of experience with board succession planning on my own and also with CEO succession planning. And board succession planning, I have to tell you, even though I have now created a software for board succession and um, uh, executive succession, board, the board succession is taking off, both, both of them are, but the board is really taking off. I created it about seven years ago. I created the process sooner than that, but I created it. It's taken all these years for people to really understand that it's needed, that we should be planning for board succession. So um, that's why we're talking about it today. Um, so what can happen if you don't plan for board succession? First off, you can have major turnover. Okay, so one of my clients right now, um, new, a new CEO came in two years ago, he just celebrated his two year anniversary. And when he came in, what sometimes this happens, and I don't know why, maybe some of you know why, but sometimes what will happen is a new CEO will come in and suddenly board members will leave. Like, okay, I did my job. I was, I was, I was on the board for this other person. This person's been on the board for a long time, or was with us for a long time. Now we went through this process, this really long process. Maybe that's what tires you out. Um, but then we see a lot of turnover when new people start. So, so, so this client, he has an engagement, uh, board engagement issue. They're not showing up for board meetings. I was I was actually facilitating their strategic planning last year, and they have seven board members and three supervisory committee members who come. Now the supervisory committee members are very committed. They stay for the whole day. The board members out of seven, I think five originally showed up. Four or five originally showed up. And by the middle, like two o'clock in the afternoon, I had one board member left. And this year, they didn't have a facilitator. Um, they, they were just gonna do it on their own. And, and the CEO called me and said, 
said, I don't know what's happening. I, I can't, I can't even get people to, I, I literally had two board members the whole day. And so we're trying to work that through. Well, what, what's also happened with them is that out of seven, they've had four people turn over in terms of the board, which is probably a good thing. Um, so what happens too when, I, when we start doing these um, succession planning, you don't realize. A lot of times, you as board members, I know our board was like this, board members who've been on the board a long time think, you know, everything's gonna be okay. We've always found other people. We've never had a lot of turnover at one time. Um, and then they find out that when we actually are doing the planning, people were planning to leave kind of all at one time, like within a two or three year period, there's gonna be four or five people leaving the board. And so this, so when you're planning, you don't wanna have major turnover and you can do more planning if you can see it and model it out. And so that's what I'm hoping that you will learn to do. Like, it, at least think about it more um, with your credit union. So major turnover is an issue. Difficulty finding new members. Any, anybody have difficulty finding new board members? Okay, like half of you. And that's, I, I, that's probably when I'm speaking around the country, that's probably the biggest thing. And I can tell you, one of my clients in Montana said, uh, called me, the CEO called me and said, gosh, darn it, I've had another board member leave. And he said, we cannot find anyone to take this person's place. And so we were talking about, talking about different strategies. They left the board seat open for a year. Then they had a previous person from your back step in, which, which kind of is a band-aid if you think about it. So in that case, they kept it open. Um, there are other cases um, that have, of credit unions that have worked with who have done the same thing. Um, they have left seats open. But we're gonna talk about strategies to find new board members. Strategies that have worked with my clients that I've seen work. And when you're planning, we're also gonna talk about having potentially a volunteer in training or an associate director program, so we probably have that. We're gonna talk a little bit about that as well. Not having the right skills on the board. So, the client I was talking about, not a lot of engagement, people leaving the board. So, last year, I'm not going to tell you which state they're in, um, but they're, they're one of the main um, um, rivals of the hackers. Um, so, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> well, actually, like three. Um, anyway, the last year, so I was I was working with them on their strategic planning, and and um, so they had a new chair of the board. They, he was with the credit union for a while, but he was new as the chair. He's an attorney. He was there. What was really weird is I got this strange vibe from him. And he wasn't like very connected with the organization. Guess what happened? And he, he didn't tell any of his board members this. He didn't tell the CEO he's doing this. He actually said to the CEO, I'm going to have, shortly after the strategic planning, I'm going to have to resign from the board. I'm going on to another board. Well, guess what he did? He went to a bank board <laughs> that competes with them. I, I was, I was like, I couldn't believe it. Well, what this guy did, <coughs> he thought, okay, well, I'm going to do this. Well, let me help them by asking my colleagues at, at where I work if they would be on the board. So suddenly, they have three attorneys out of seven board members, which, so you do want to have the right skills. And so we're working on that, that with them. Um, I, I'm in there working with them quite heavily. Just talked to the chair 
the chair is a stay-at-home mom, and she is she wants to do such a good job. But last year when I was at, she had just had a baby. She was vice chair at the time. She had just had a baby, and she brought her baby to the board meeting. I don't know if you've ever experienced anything like this. But she was breastfeeding. And that's the one thing that the CEO warned me about is that we have we have a, a board member who's young, and and that's I know you laugh, it's it's but it's something that if you're going to get younger board members and some of you know some of them might be thinking like her. I need to bring my child. Now, uh, there are some things you can do, and that's another topic, but um, anyway. So we do want to get the right skills on the board. So if we're doing some planning, we can get the, the right skills. Lack of experience for board leadership. So this is one of the things that I actually just added to my software, because people were, were struggling with trying to figure out who's going to lead the board. If you have a bunch of turnover on your board, who's going to lead? Who's going to want to lead? Because most of the time, and I tell people this, how long, well, let me ask you this. How long do you think it takes a new board member to feel comfortable in their role as a board member, to learn about the credit unit, feel comfortable in their role? A year. A year? Two to three years? Three. 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 Yeah, it's, it's, it's like three. I even think sometimes four years, so three to four years. Um, and I, I actually wrote a book a, a number of years back. In the book, and I didn't, I, I'm not including it in the slides today, but in there I talk about the contribution curve. So the learning, lifting, and leaving curve. And um, so the learning curve is really high. And you know, since you're learning and it takes three to four years for you to to really feel comfortable, should you be in a leadership role? Probably not. Unless you've actually been a leader at like a nonprofit on another board somewhere. And that's why if you are, if it looks like you're gonna have a lot of turnover at your credit union, it's good to have board experience and board leadership as one of the competencies that you're looking for in new board in a new board member. Because then maybe they can come on the board and get into the leadership role much faster. We're going to talk a little bit more about leadership because I have some more questions for you on that. Hey Tom, can I just ask you three L's learning, listening, and leading? Uh, learning, lifting. lifting. Yeah, learning, the learning phase, you're learning about the credit union, about what your role is. Lifting is you are probably on uh, the executive committee or board leadership. You probably are the chair of a committee. Um, you're doing a little bit more. And then the leaving phase is probably about the last three years um, that you're on the board. Um, and so you're still active, on the board. you're always active. When you're on the board, you should always be engaged. But when you're leaving, you're less likely to be on like the executive committee or board leadership, but you might still lead a committee, that sort of thing. But you are more participating than leading during the leading stage. Okay? Yep. So your board culture can change dramatically. I have, have any of you experienced that when you had new people come on the board? Yeah, and especially if there's one person trying to uh, recruit people that they know. So that can be, that can be an issue. We'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit as well. All right, I'm gonna tell you a story. Two story. This is about an over a nine year period. All right, so this credit union started talking about the need for board succession planning in 2008. I'm, I'm going to tell you the story because the story continues. It's nice to know, how, you know the continuation of what's happened. Uh, this credit 
So the average age on the board at this time in 2008 was 66 and a half. And the average tenure was 14 and a half. And there are nine board members. There are nine board members, okay? So they thought, I think what we need to do is we need to take a look at board succession planning. And so they had a board development committee. Um, board development committee could be called the board governance committee. Do any of you have that kind of committee? No? Okay. Also, uh, so board succession planning, just so you know, because I, I do so much consulting in this, um, with so many credit units, it can be tasked some credit will have a board development committee or board governance committee. That's a committee that deals with all board policies, board practices, education, that sort of thing. Okay? What other credit unions do, some other credit unions will task board succession planning to their nominating committee. Okay? Nominating committee you have? Okay. So most, most credit unions have a nominating committee. Um, so some will say we want it to be in our board development committee or board governance to figure out what skills we need. Then they tell the nominating committee what to look for. But others will say, let's just give it all to the nominating committee. Okay? So in the, this credit was tasked, they did have a board development committee. So they talked, the committee talked to us all board members on the committee. They talked and they said, talked about everything. How are we going to do this? How are we going to do succession planning? And they thought about it and they thought, okay, we grandfather everybody in and then we can have term limits. So we can have three five year terms. No, five three year terms, I should say. So 15 years. Now, if you ask me what the average, if credit unions have term limits, what the average is out there, it's 12. Does anybody have term limits? You do? What, 12? Uh, oh, no. Oh, you have three year terms. Right. Yeah. But you have up to 12 years. Okay. All right. Or they also said age 75. Okay, so the committee then. At the next board meeting, put a policy together and brought it to the board and said, uh, what do you think about this? <laughs> no way. They were just like, no way do we want this. First of all, isn't that major discrimination? Now, in Wisconsin, we, we don't have that. Uh, for volunteers, we don't have. Uh, uh, the protected class. There are states like Washington, Colorado, they do have protections for the volunteers. Uh, we don't really uh, have have that here. However, we don't, uh, obviously we don't want to uh, discriminate against uh, people. But, so that was one of the things that they said. And, but it was the common, there's never been a problem. Why would we do this? I don't know what you're trying to get at. And so they decided to step back and um, go back to work. So uh, the head of the uh, development committee met with the non-committee members and said, okay, so what, what's the deal? Why are you not happy about this? Um, why, do you have any other ideas? Because we do have to do something. So they came up with a new concept and brought it to the board. And you know, it, you, you might think, okay, they started in 2008, now they're beginning in February of 2010. Well, you know, as board members, you go to your you go to your board meetings once a month, and then if you have committee meetings, so there they may be once a quarter. Um, so this takes a little bit of time to get through. So they decided, let's have all the board members fill out what's called an intentions form. Annually, stating when they anticipate leaving the board. Okay? 
it, A, you can change it. You can change it up every year, but, but let's take a look so we can kind of anticipate what people are leaving. And so they said, uh, a person who was the chair of the committee said to the board, please, let's just try this. Could we just try this? And so they approved it. Everybody was happy, especially the committee, especially the chair of the committee, was happy. Uh, so when they, when they did it, this is what happened. These are the, the results. In the first year, six board members were leaving within a four-year period, and that four-year period was going to start within two years. Six out of nine. Then what happened to them is one of the people who said, oh, I'm not leaving until like 2020, until like 20, see, in my mind, 2020 is so far away, um, till like 2030. He had to leave within a few months of, of actually this being approved. So not he wasn't even one of these six people. So that's seven people. Isn't that incredible? And this happens. I just did, I just worked with a client in Wisconsin, in North Wisconsin. Um, and they kind of thought it might happen. This might be the case for them, but they were, but they weren't sure. And when I was there doing the facilitation and we got to the modeling, almost the exact pattern was going to happen with them. And so they were like, oh my gosh. And for them, they had just hired a younger board member. And she, she, she actually was sitting next to me when, when, I, when we got there. And I asked her how long she'd been on the board, and she said a year. And when she had, when we had done the prep for the facilitation, I had had them do their intentions forms and send them to me ahead of time. And I said, oh, I saw that you're only going to um, just complete your, your term, and then you're going off. And she said, I, I, I was so excited about being a board member for the credit union. I love it, but we have a young family. My husband travels for work just can't make the meetings and I feel really bad and so she was she was going to try to stay to the end of the three years but if you think about it like you said like we just found out at three years she's fully competent now probably as a board member and, and in fact on our board we had somebody leave he wasn't reelected he was beat out by someone else on the ballot he was an incumbent he was beat out. He had been on the board for four years, and he was angry. He was so angry because he said, and I was chair at the time, and he said, I just feel like I, I understand everything, and that I can really contribute, and now I wasn't reelected. So, uh, but you know, with younger people, I think what we're going to run into is we're going to run into, they're not going to stay in these long 12, 15, 20, 25, 30 years. They're not going to do it. So we, that's why this is so important. So they have all this turnover. They're in the ninth year of doing this. Now their average age is 57.1. Remember, it was 66 and a half. The average tenure is six, six, a little over six years. But there are two people who have been there for more than 17 years. So if you take those two people out, the average tenure is 2.8 years for nine, for the seven other board members. That's, I mean, then try to figure out what you're gonna do with board leadership. So this is happening over and over again um, in credit unions all over. Does anybody feel like this is probably an example of their credit union? Okay. Um, so they were happy that they did this. Um, the Board Development Committee develops the plan and provides it to the nominating committee. 
and then it's updated on a regular basis. Um, this is actually our credit. I was the chair of the Board Development Committee, and I can tell you that the day that I had to break the term limit and age limit policy to the board, um, I <laughs> I was presenting it, but you know I had a committee that was supposed to be supporting me. <laughs> and when the other board members were yelling about it, nobody else said anything. So the consultant he was like, okay, let's just bring this back. We'll figure it out, out a different process. And I thought, well, let me just, I'm gonna talk to each board member who didn't like it, see what they think. And then that's when I came up with the intentions for them. process and trying to anticipate when people are gonna leave. Um, and that's where Succession App came, really came from, from, from our credit union, but also a lot of my clients were experiencing the same thing. So I was like, there has to be a better way to do this. So possible solutions for board succession planning. One is a formalized board succession process, like the one I just outlined for you. Another one is age limits. Anybody have age limits? I didn't ask that. You do. So what's the age? I'd rather not say. Was <laughs> <laughs> it like 80 or 85 or something? <laughs> you, have, you actually do have age limits? Yes. But you don't want to tell us? All right, it's 70. 70? 70. 70. No. Um, you're, I wouldn't feel bad about that. Um, but I can tell you this, I'll show you some research. So there's also term limits. But have you heard of the Filene Research Institute? Okay, so I looked at the study because I was doing a presentation um, earlier in the year for a large credit union at West. And we were taught, and there, uh, it's a large, two large credit unions that merged recently. One was my client, and now they're like a $3.5 billion, $4 billion. So these are almost $4 billion. And the, board, the boards were having an issue with each other about governance. And so I did some research. This is, the, this is the most recent I could find on anything. But from 2014, 18% of credit unions have term limits and 5% have age. So it's not very common out there. And I, don't, I actually don't think you know, this is from 2014. I actually don't think the numbers have changed that much um, around this, so. Although, I, I, you know, so I was in Santa Fe uh, sponsoring a uh, Hughes event, and I was, um, I had my succession app booth there, and somebody came up to me and said, oh my gosh, we really need your help. And I said, well, tell me a little bit about what's happening on your board. And she said, um, we have board members who should be leaving the board, and they're not. And I said, well, do you know why they might, you know, why, what's keeping them? I, I know they're committed, and I know that some people just like to get out of the house and social and that sort of thing. Um, she said, I'm trying to remember now, they actually get long-term care insurance. They actually provide long-term care insurance for their board members. So they, they you know, they pay the full, the credit union pays the full premium. Um, so why would you? That's what I, I was just like. Oh my gosh! So that's why there's not. A of and she goes, "What am I going to do?" And she was younger than most of the other ones. And she said, "She said, by principle, when I started on the board, I refused to take the coverage. I've had people not take like." If, um, if there's a expense reimbursement or like a, um, oh gosh, what is that called? Uh, 
when you get so much money per diem. Per diem. Yeah, like, like, or, you know, like, and it's supposed to be related to covering your expenses for the month. Mm -hmm. I've had people reject that, but, uh, but long-term care insurance is pretty expensive. Yeah. And for someone to say they're not home to have that. But, you know, that's tough. That's tough. Um, so, we didn't solve that problem uh, that day, obviously. Um, we'd be working with their, their board on some succession planning and to try to figure out what they could make, maybe do um, to help with that. So. Okay, one of the things that I experience is that board members do not want to do succession planning. And why do you think that is? Because they're facing their own mortality. Facing, yeah. Actually, <laughs> you that is a that is a good reason. I I have to tell you, I'm working with a. Now that you bring that up, kind of that way, I'm working with a non a large nonprofit in Nashville, a mental health care nonprofit, and the CEO, the founding CEO, is 75 years old, and we're working on CEO succession. She said she wanted to work on it because she said. I'll know what I know when I want to leave, but I think I, I think it might be soon. But as soon as we started working on it, she started saying, I feel like we're planning. She said it right out loud in front of the board. She goes, I think we're, like, I feel like we're planning my funeral. So, so some people do feel like you're trying to get the older people off the board, driving older members or long-term members off the board, or you're judging the skill, because what we want to do is we want to write, you know, there are some skills that we do want on the board that we want represented on the board. And so people say, well, if we're gonna do board succession planning, figure out what skills we need, then if I don't have those skills, you're gonna kick me off the board. Well, they're not, that's not the reason we do board succession planning. It's about being ready for inevitable turnover and knowing what skills to look for in future directors. Um, so we want to know when people might be leaving, so we're ready, and what skills we need to look for in a new person. Okay, so what are the steps to create, oh, question. You know, we, we, we struggle with uh, succession plan. We do really do, and then we do have a three. Oh yeah, Jenny has a mic. We, we probably, uh, I don't know, what is our youngest board member, 25 or, or probably like that. And then we're pretty, the two oldest ones are probably here. But um, we, we require uh, a lot of education. We, we want them to be uh, within two years to have the CCUV uh, uh, certification. And, and we put a lot of uh, emphasis on education. And it seems like the younger, ones have a hard time doing that, to take the time to be able to get it. So it ends up that when they see all the requirements, they don't stay as long. But it seems like when you're into that, I don't know, when, once you're an in, in, in nester and something else, yeah. it seems like we can get those people to be on it more easier. Yeah. So I, it just, some, I, I don't know what the solution is or anything else, but I think it's more than just to have an age and a term. Right. Uh, more to it. Oh yeah, there's there. That's why our committee decided not to use those and to do more of what I was showing you. What I would say is two years might not be long enough. You might want to spread that out for that certification. And I also, the certification or or requiring education. Um, a lot of credit unions that pay their board members. Do any of you get paid? Okay, a couple of you. So, board, uh, board, board credit unions that where they pay their board members, it's more common to require that sort of thing. Um, I would say just make the make it a longer period that they have to get the certification. I can tell you, being uh, you know the chair and on the executive committee about the $3 million credit union. 
Well, the credit union was $360 million when I started 20 years ago, and now we're $3 billion. It was a lot of work, and it does. So as you get bigger, it, there are lots more requirements for board members. What? And, and, and that, it, it's in like that's we really want the younger ones to be able to something that they, they, they have a hard time with the time. Yeah. Yep. That's why we have to do more. And, and that's just an observation. Yeah. No, but that's that's why we have to do board succession planning because we're going to have more turnover, I feel like. We have a question back there. You, you haven't mentioned anything about diversity. Sure. Yeah. Um, in terms of diversity, um, Actually, in my uh, in my software, I actually do have a whole section, a whole tab on diversity. So I have credit unions that can then prioritize diversity. So they can prioritize ethnicity, potentially, age. Like I have credit unions that say, I want people who are between the age of 25 and 45. Um, I also have gender. This large credit unit, you know, I was just talking about the two that merged in our four billion. Guess what? The, my client had nine board members. And I can't remember, I think the other one had seven. And now they have 15 board members, and guess how many women are on the board? Two. Good, good guesses here. Two women. So, but they've been using my software for a while. They've been, they've been doing a good job of planning the original crime union. So, yes, diversity is very important to consider when you're doing um, succession planning. The other thing is, if you are, if your credit union is regionalized, so you have branches in different regions, and so you'd like some representation on your board from different areas, like for example, us in Madison, <laughs> Um, we're very active also in Milwaukee, and so we would like to have, in our board succession, we had that um, we would, a priority was getting somebody from Milwaukee. And if we could get somebody from the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, that would be even better. And we got somebody three years ago. She's worked out fabulously. We'd love to get another person from Milwaukee. So, so regionalize and then prioritizing that. So yes, diversity in those ways, very, very important. Uh, when we're looking, thank you. When we're looking for a new board member, uh, we emphasize culture. Culture of our credit union and also culture of our board. Uh, when we're interviewing a potential board member, uh, even though they may have lots of qualifications, if we get the feeling that they have an ulterior motive or an ego that's not going to mesh with the rest of the board, then we don't consider that individual. Good. I, you can say no to, oh well, unless you, how many of you actually at your annual meeting, people can just raise their hand and run for? You still have that? It's becoming less common now. Because one of the most important parts of being a board member is you have to find good board members to represent the credit union and your members, right? The reason we've been doing that at our annual meetings is because on two occasions, we had somebody do that who was not qualified to run. So then we created a policy where they have to apply to run ahead of time. Make sure, that's pretty embarrassing to have somebody get elected at your annual meeting who wasn't qualified to run in the first place. And by allowing them to raise their hands, you can get yourself into that environment. Right, and how many of you actually do background checks on your potential board members? Do you do that? You need to be doing background checks as well if you're not, if you're not doing that currently. One thing that our credit union has done is to, uh, we have an associate directors program and an emeritus. So we have three associates always that um, they sit right with us, right with the board, and the only thing that they don't do is vote. 
So that's kind of like a grooming process. So we, as a board, get a chance to have them with us and see how they're acting, interacting, uh, questions, answers, etc. And then when an opening comes open on the board, we, as a nominating committee, then look at um, bringing one of the associates up and then filling, and filling that also. And we also have an emeritus, one person that is an emeritus. And it has to be a person that's had 10 years as a board member as an emeritus. Okay. And so that brings in the historical perspective there. So, so I was going to talk about the slave board we talk about right now. Um, so associate directors do um, have become more and more common as a way to prepare for that turnover. Okay. <coughs> so, an associate director generally you don't want them to be an associate for more than like two years before they're going to get, actually get on the board. Um, some credit unions have had associate board members who are like associate board members for five or six years. Well, if you have people that are that patient, great. But usually you want, um, we've had a hard time with having them even be more than like with all of our turnover, four or six months. Because what's really nice about associate directors too, the program, is they actually come to the credit union and they can learn about the responsibilities that they would have as a director, what things they would vote on, how the meetings work, all of that, which is really, really important. Um, so we call that, some call it associate director, some call it volunteer training. Um, and then you also mentioned emeritus status. So some credit, so this is becoming more common as well, and there are some credit unions that use it to kind of incentivize, I guess, longer term board members to leave the board, um, and they become emeritus, and then they're emeritus forever. And they don't really have any qualifications for that emeritus. Um, however, there are credit unions that, that when you're an emeritus, like yours, they have to have been on the board for at least 10 years, or um, and maybe they had to have been on, uh, in a board leadership role. Um, at our credit union, you have to be nominated by, you have to do those two things. Plus, you have to be nominated by at least three board members and then approved by the full board to be an emeritus. So emeritus can be like, it can just simply be a passage or it can be an honor, more of an honor. Uh, the thing you do have to watch out for is when one of my clients decided to use the emeritus, but what they wanted to do was they said, we're going to limit it to two at a time. Only two people could be emeritus, <coughs> which I was like, hmm, I wonder. Uh, so then when we were working on their board succession plan, like two years later, um, they were like, they were going to have this all this turnover, but then they had no way of saying you're emeritus for so long. So they had two more people who wanted to leave, but they already had two people in emeritus, and they would have loved to have given the two people who wanted to leave emeritus status. And I said, okay. So now what we have to do is talk about what the the guidelines on emeritus, the emeritus program. Because you can have more of that too, and you're probably going to want that. Um, so that, so just a caution there. <coughs> um, yes. What we do on our board is we actually have our nominating committee, um, but then we also allow um, members to take out papers to run for that position, and they actually have to accumulate so many signatures in order to be even considered. And then those people that we run a background check, and if they pass all of that, then they're actually up for the position and it's voted on. Is it a lot of signatures? Um, I think it's 40. Okay, so that's not too not bad. A lot. That's not too bad. I, I know some credit unions that require like 100 or 200, and what you're, for anybody who wants to run. Now, I think that, that, 
that could be an issue. Because people are saying to me all over the country, we can't find board members. And so and then if you're putting that block in there of, yeah, if you want to be a board member, you have to find signatures, you have to get signatures. Now, there are credit unions that I know um, that what happens is if the person isn't selected for the ballot, like if they want it to be, they're vetted, they don't, they are put on the ballot, then they can get signatures to be put on the ballot. That's a different, that's a different story, different way to look at it. So I'm gonna keep going here because we have quite a bit of information, yeah. Um, so steps to creating a board succession plan, assess the needs of the organization, compile a list of critical competencies that you'd like represented on the board, assess the current board members to determine where the gaps are, Develop a process to anticipate departures. Build a list of potential board members. Very important to always have a list. And then develop a formal policy. Um, so three major issues resulting from turnover. One is finding new board members. One is planning for board leadership. And the other is board onboarding. Because can you imagine, like when we had nine people leaving, how much onboarding that took? And I was chair for four of those years. <laughs> it was, I was exhausted. Because, you know, if it takes three or four years for somebody to get up to speed, if they're really engaged, they're asking a lot of questions, which is great. But, it, you know, who are they asking? What, and I'll show you in a little bit. Um, I recommend having a mentor on the board so that they can ask the mentor, um, assigning a mentor. Actually, um, this happened This happened to me as well. Um, we, hi we hired, <coughs> we got a new board member. And um, I didn't really know him that well. I think he's really good, he's at the university. And so we're sitting at, we're sitting around the boardroom and we have board portal in an iPad and I so we're talking and going through the meeting and I keep seeing him like googling it seems like he's doing something and so the next meeting I thought I'm gonna sit next to him and we're assigned seats we were assigned seats um, and they change up they can change up they actually we have in our credit union we have tents. Um, not that we don't know each other's names, but um, in case the, the, it helps the executive assistant in case you have any mail or if she needs to give you something. And she can move people around. So anyway, I said to her, I want to sit next to him and see what's going on. Because I was just like, what? What is he doing? Is he not not engaged? Do we do we have to do something? What was happening is you know there are so many acronyms in the credit union industry. Every time an acronym was stated, he was looking it up on Google. He was Googling, and then he was writing it down, what it meant. So one of the things we did for our board onboarding is we provided a whole list of acronyms for our new board members. All right, so biggest problem is finding potential board members. So, um, what are some what are some strategies before I tell you what um, like I have a list of about ten different strategies, but how do you find board members? Yes. Each of the board members should be able to go into their personal role decks or network and offer you at least one suggestion. Not that that works, but to me that makes sense. Okay. So she said that each board member um, should be able to provide some at least one name. So get names from board members is one idea. Talk to the front line and get some recommendations from them. They see our members all the time. So the front line, front line of the staff. I know that people do ask their executives. We'll talk about um, whether we ask our CEO or not in a little bit. 
we uh, advertise in our monthly uh, newsletter and then have uh, individuals that are interested in being on the board, uh, then they submit their name to the nominating committee, then the nominating committee does a background check mm -hmm. and interviews them to see if they are qualified. Okay, so you do it on your newsletter, in your newsletter. <coughs> Good. Any other strategies? <coughs> okay, right there. We'll just try to Get somebody from your select employee groups. Okay. And have them be an ambassador to over there. Yep. And sometimes, if you have, uh, if you're site based, um, you'll have somebody leaving, and then they'll find somebody from that same site to take their place. Sometimes that happens. Um, yes. One in the back there. One thing I will caution against is that when the board knows that they're looking for new board members, some of them just go out and say to someone, you know, are you interested in being on the board? We're looking for board members. And then they bring that back to the board and another board member says, well, that person's had a lot of financial difficulty in the business world. Are you sure that we want to have them? So what we've changed recently is that bring those names to the board, let us discuss them and how they might fit and the skills they could bring, and then go out and ask them to be interested. Perfect, <coughs> perfect. One of the first things we do, um, what I recommend, is when they get a name, usually they're people who are out there in business, go on LinkedIn and check them out. You know, are they on LinkedIn? And I tell my CEOs, that, you know, the CEOs I work with all over the country, and, and many of them that I coach, I, I can't believe that some of them are still hesitant. I mean, some of them are younger, and they're still hesitant to go on to have a profile on LinkedIn. It actually gives you credibility. So we, we kind of take a look at LinkedIn, too, um, to see if they're there as well. Let me give you some ideas. Some of your ideas are up here. So, oh, first of all, let's talk about this. So this is kind of, this can be controversial. So I want to, I want to hear what, you guys, one time. One time I have about 200 people in the room, and I literally had to stop like a, a war going on um, with this question so I could continue with the um, presentation. So do you think the CEO should be involved in recruiting new board members? How many think yes? Okay, anybody think no? Okay. All right. Why do you think no? Because he's literally picking his own boss. Okay, so what he said is he's literally picking his own boss. So that's one reason. You said no? Well, no, I didn't say no. But I I'm kind of dependent on the relationship the board has with the CEO, I would think. You know, if you have a really, really good relationship with your CEO, I don't think it would be a problem. On the other hand, if you have a CEO and the board that doesn't have a great relationship with it, that could be a problem. So okay. I think it would depend on the circumstances. Okay, so I believe that it is advantageous to have your CEO, maybe your executives, out there uh, looking and providing the nominating committee with names, but then it's the board's responsibility to do to do the vetting and decide if they want the person or not. Um, because at this at this big event where everybody started yelling back and forth, a woman from Texas stood up and she said, "I know all of you think." Over, and it seemed like it was on the sides of the room. It was really odd how it was set up. But she stood up and she said, I know that you guys think that um, probably the board member or the board chair or some member is going to fill the board with, um, or the CEO is going to recommend people to fill the board uh, who are friends. But she said, what's worse is when board members try to fill their board, and then the board becomes clickish, full of clicks. And she said that happened at our credit union, it was awful. She said, she said so that can happen, you know, it can happen, but you, you just have to have a really good process, nominating committee process. 
for picking your board members. Yes. I refuse my CEO to check out the names provided, you know, someone interested. I do like my CEO looking into their background. Number one, are they a member of our credit, our credit union? Yeah. Number two, are they on the brink of bankruptcy? Uh, you know, as a board member, I don't have access to the information. I can't go in and get their credit score. I can't do a lot of things that the CEO can at the credit union and the <coughs> management person. But the board doesn't have that that prerogative yeah. say. So I will run it past him and you know, that's why we use our associate director position also instead of taking one from the floor because we've had the opportunity to go look into their background and see if there's, you know, mm -hmm. someone stands up and they have an alternative more. And he stopped a couple of those from coming forward and even being nominated. So they they can be useful, but they're not my lackey. Yeah. I use their information. Yeah. Okay, so keep moving here. Uh, so, so some effective strategies. Send out e blasts members. Uh, advertise the search on your website. So you can put it on your website. Um, a big newsletter. Ask board members to provide names. Uh, form a recruiting and search committee to put an extra focus on it. Recruit from credit union committees. Um, how many of you have your supervisory or audit committee members become members of the board? Do you recruit from those from that committee? Oh, you don't? Some of you do? It in the other direction. Our new members of the board are on the audit committee. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, that's, that, you're a totally different group. Than well, it's what state. In other states. Yeah, some states, your supervisory committee members or your audit committee members have to be elected by membership. Well, federal credit unions is required by law, but it's not state credit unions. That's why state credit unions often have audit committees and federal credit unions always have supervisory. <laughs> Yeah. Because the law requires them to have it. The state credit unions fulfill the same function, but they do it through doctrine. Yeah, there are some states that actually have have everybody, all credit unions have to have um, those people elected by the members. Um, ask the CEO for names. Monthly state, now, I mean, hopefully we're almost all electronic, so we don't have this. So pretty soon I'm going to take this one off. Um, include an article in the newsletter, like he said, and then determine the competencies like we have just talked about, about the board discussion process. This is one thing when we need it, when we actually need it, um, and we're actively looking for board members, we use these, uh, like, these, like, table tents, put these in the, in branches, and said we were looking for uh, board members. And actually, some people saw that, so that seemed to work as well. Uh, we already kind of talked about ways to get potential people trained, associate director, director of training, volunteers on committees. Um, there are just two other things. I don't even have about five minutes before the break here. Uh, plan for board leadership, you want to do that. Um, you're going you're to get a copy of this, so I'm just going to go through this fairly quickly. But board leadership is really, really important. So what I recommend is putting together guidelines on board leadership. Now you don't have to have a policy that says you can only be chair for two years and then you have to go. Make them guidelines so that you have some flexibility, but have some of these in place. So should there be a minimum number of years a person should be a board member before they're elected to the executive committee? If yes, how many years? If yes, does it depend on the position? So, do you have a, a minimum number of years somebody needs to be on the board before they're on the board leadership? No? People are saying no. Okay. If no, what factors would be taken into consideration when determining the appropriateness? So, for example, how many of you think 
every board member should be able to or should be the chair at some point. Okay, so there are a few of you. All right. Okay, so what if this happened now? I had a credit union, seven members, and they rotated it, okay? It was rotation. They said they required everybody to be the chair at some point. And the youngest person on the board, who was 63, but the youngest person on the board, who was supposed to be the chair next, I'm, I'm, not, I'm resigning. Resigned from the board. So you lost a good board member, the youngest person, because you made that requirement. <clears throat> Um, other questions, should there, be, should there be a limit on the number of years you're on the executive committee or in a certain position? If so, how many years? You should have just guidelines on, on these types of things, so you'll get all this. Should somebody be vice chair before their chair, for example? All right, so um, last part here, orienting new board members. So how many of you think you do a really good job of orienting new board members? Because I was going to say, tell us what you did. Because this is one thing that's really hard. It takes a lot of time. So there needs to be, when you have uh, orientation, when you have a new board member, there should be coordination between the CEO and the chair. Because I do think it's valuable for a new board member to meet with the CEO, to meet potentially with some of the executives like CFO, COO, um, just to learn a little bit more about the credit union. What I used to do, do you have funds, funds management committee or ALM committee? Okay, what I used to do when I was chair is when, because we had so much turnover, new board members, I would put them on that committee so that they would be learning about the financials of the board, of the, of the credit union. So that was, Something that was, kind of, and they kept doing that. Um, I recommend having a, a signing a board mentor, somebody who's who's a very engaged board member, who's been on the board for a while, um, and they can sit next to that person so they can answer questions while you're in the meeting, but they can also um, give the person check in with the person. They'll have a you know email and, and phone number so they can check in. Um, I think that there needs to be a balance between the written and the online and the in-person. So it's good to have resources they can go to in the board portal, but then also I think it's good to have some, some in-person orientation as well. Like I said, the CEO, executives, the board chair as well. I know what I did as a board chair is I would um, in particular, talk about the compensation and how that's determined, uh, because that seems to be kind of a big issue when we get to that point. And I always want board members, new board members, to be prepared for that uh, when it comes. Um, and then I, I have a list of common topics here that you might, that you might have in your in your orientation. All right, and then just, um, you can take a look at uh, my website. I do have two videos, actually Brian edited the videos for you. Um, two videos that um, are solutions for board succession planning, and there's one for executive succession planning as well. I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you a little bit about that in the next session, but um, I know it's a lot of information. I even took a bunch of slides out because this is, and of course you can tell I'm passionate about this topic. I want everybody to do board succession planning and to be ready because uh, it's so important. Um, so, but yeah, I'm 